And we are live. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are Naked Security by Sophos, and we are back on Facebook Live. Um, hi, Duck. Hello, Charlotte. How are you? I'm great. Okay, great. I'm just waiting to see if anyone is watching. Oh, hello. We've got two watchers. We've got great. two viewers. Okay, so today we are talking about Linux, and in particular, Linux malware, and in particular, particular, Linux distros that have been poisoned with malware. So I think we need to get to the bottom of something before we start, though, Doug. I don't like that tone. <laughs> I, I, I think something suspicious is coming. No, no, but we are digging into, into your preferences here. You and Linux, are you friends or foes? Well, that's interesting. As everybody knows, I'm kind of become a bit of a Mac fan, and that's because A, I used Unix before I used Windows, or before Windows existed, used Unix before Linux, and I now have this laptop that does everything I want as well as any operating system I want. Calling all people, sorry, we, everything you say is being broadcast. We've got, a, we've got a straggler who insists on being on the telephone and on Facebook Live at the same time. We're hoping to embarrass him, shame him so he goes away and leaves I us to worked. our silence. We think it worked. Now he's walking behind us being as noisy <laughs> as ever. So that's why I love my Mac. I love my Mac because it is a thing of beauty. It's like sort of Bauhaus meets the 21st century. But I have used Linux for years. I had a work laptop for many years before I got my first Mac that ran Slackware Linux, so I'm an old school guy. I know Linux from back when you had to nick your own mode lines. So yeah, friend, definitely friends, not foes. Okay, so I, I think we Just to clear that up, yeah. in case anyone thinks I'm here to say, oh, Linux malware, bad guys. I think we've, uh, we've seen that you, you may have changed your allegiance to the uh, Hipster devices shortly now, but... I think I'll pretend I didn't hear I that. Think we can assume that you're on Linux's side. Don't mention that I've got an iPhone. I didn't say anything. Okay. I would never Good. say that. Definitely not on uh, Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> so, but actually, what, what we're talking about today is, is it's not really about malware at all, is it? It's kind of more about what we can learn from these data breaches um, when they happen to sort of enthusiasts in the open source community rather than like mega corporations. That's right. The, the, the one I want to, there's been, a, there's been a few Linux breaches over the last year or so. In fact, we wrote about one today in a distro called Arch. That was just their user repository, but somebody put some malware in there in the hope that they could, that they could kind of maybe take control of a few incautious users' computers. What I want to focus on is, uh, this is a distro called Gen2. Gen2 is a type of penguin, and penguin is the Linux logo, that's the joke. They have a, they, their distro was, uh, attackers got in by guessing a password, and they made some systematic changes to the entire distribution tree, fortunately not in the master repository, in the secondary repository, and what that meant is that anybody who updated from this secondary repository, in other words, did an update and downloaded stuff and rebuilt it, would, could actually get their, their files damaged. So what this meant is that when people noticed, Gen2, this is not a megacorp, it's just a group of enthusiasts, are now faced with a data breach problem. They've got to fess up, they've got to say what's going on, and they've got to try and keep this clear so users don't panic and, and can judge what happened. So that's what I really want to look at. The breach happened, malware got onto their system, how did they respond and did it work out? Uh, our, our, our regular viewer, Teresa, says hello there. Hello, Teresa. <laughs> and Martin says nice shirt. It get, is a great we shirt. We always get one of those. Shop.sophos.com <laughs> if you wish to purchase one for yourself. You can also get great laptop stickers but if you put one on a Mac, particularly one of these cool 12-inch MacBooks, you will be in trouble with me. <laughs> Just thought I'd say that. Um, so what did this malware actually do? Basically, it infected the Gen2 repository, and it wouldn't really infect the computer of people who downloaded it, it would affect them. The idea was that if you download one of, one of the poisoned packages, a package is a, a software lump that you get, so when you, when you install a Linux distro, typically you'll have a bunch of packages for the various software options you've chosen to go along with it. If you downloaded and updated any of the packages, what would happen is 
in the middle of doing the build and the install and the update of the package, the crooks had squirreled away a command that would go to the top of your directory tree and try and delete all the files underneath it. So basically, they'd poisoned the repository. If you updated from it, the idea was it would, it would basically just teach some kind of misguided lesson to anybody for reasons that we're not sure of. So Teresa said she's, she missed the intro, but I think, and she said, what's the risk to users of the affected software? But I think you might have brought in uh... Well, actually, that's important because, of course, when you have a breach like this and people realize, oh, the crooks have been in your entire source code, they've got, they've put malware just about everywhere through this repository, then an immediate and frank response which Gen2 did very, very quickly without getting bogged down in some of the marketing and legalistic stuff that sometimes seems to make commercial companies take ages in the case of a data breach, they were actually able to reassure people fairly quickly. The, the truth is that this was only a secondary repository, one hosted on GitHub, not the master one that most users using automatic updating would connect to by default. The other thing is they were quickly able to say, you know what, the crooks got in, they messed up everything in this repository, but they did not, as far as we can tell, get our signing keys, our digital private keys, so they couldn't sign their malicious updates so that anybody who's doing verification, which happens by default, wouldn't install this stuff without getting a giant warning. So the good news is that the risk to people was very low. But in the case of many data breaches, that's not obvious at first if the company that's had the breach is trying to decide on the best way to spin the story. And Gen2 didn't, that, didn't do that. They said what they knew very quickly. They said what they didn't know. And they promised they'd go away and find it out. They did. It took them several days. It was probably five days of agony. And then at the end, they came good and they published absolutely everything they'd learned. And importantly, what they were going to do differently in future so it's very unlikely that this kind of thing could happen again. I think that was an excellent response. So if we, if we go back to the attack itself, if, this wasn't money-making crooks out to plant kind of ransomware or keyloggers or crypto miners. Do you think it could have been some kind of turf war or grudge of some sort? You mean like virus writing like it's 1999 all <laughs> over again? It looks like that. Obviously, if you get into a distro and you mess up the files, then you have caused great embarrassment to the community that runs that distro. Or if it's a company, um, you know, a commercial company, you cause embarrassment to that company. Even if nobody's data ever gets abused, you've created this, this fear, this lack of trust uh, in the community. So. Uh, we don't know what the motivation was. The idea was that anyone who did get affected would have their files wiped out, they'd have to reinstall from scratch, they'd have to load all their stuff from backup. So it would be kind of be like getting hit by ransomware where you couldn't pay any money to get your files back at any cost. So it doesn't look as though these guys had any idea of, uh, of making money out of this. Was it to embarrass Gen 2? Was it, as you said, a turf war? Was it a grudge? Was it because they only attacked the GitHub repository and Microsoft bought GitHub and GitHub's supposed to be for open source? And for some reason, Microsoft, though they have loads of open source these days, is seen as open source's enemy. We just don't know. The important thing is, it doesn't matter. And even to Windows communities and Mac communities, not all crooks, most of them, but not all crooks are motivated by money. Some of them are motivated by their good old school motivations of I can do it because I can and I don't care. Chaos for chaos's sake. And the problem is that whether the guy's out to make $100,000 or nothing, if all your data gets trashed, the impact on you is exactly the same. Oh, we've got another, um, another regular, regular watcher, Karen, Hello. she says Hello, hi Karen. from Arizona. Hi and from Arizona. We've had another request, where do I get the shirt? Alex is asking. Shop.sophos.com. There we go. Shirts, laptop stickers, very cool socks, including, including NT blue screen of death socks, that's our most popular. And for those about to code, we salute you, socks, all sorts of stuff. You can even buy bicycles, although they're a little more expensive than the laptop stickers, <laughs> so hold your breath before you look at those. And, they're very um, high-end ones. <laughs> and Matthew's given us a wave, um, and Teresa's saying, did you mention stickers? Yes, <laughs> laptop stickers of all sorts, available so, in convenient packs. So let's go back to the lessons. What, what can we learn from these kind of really, you know, cowardly and, and 
apparently a pointless attacks on a bunch of enthusiastic volunteers. Well, the same. The, what what the commercial world can learn out of this, and what ev pe even people sitting at home can learn out of this, I think there are three things. First is that if you get breached, you do legally, morally, and technically, if you like, you owe your customers or your users an explanation, because if you can't explain it to them, then you almost certainly can't explain it to yourself. Gentoo did that very well. If you go on Naked Security and look at how we wrote this up, you'll see that we thought they did a good job, primarily because they got clear, plain speaking news out quickly, and they didn't get bogged down in kind of marketing spin where you try and take really bad news and sort of polish it so it looks good. That doesn't really convince anyone. They want to know what's going on. Most importantly, they want to know, am I at risk? How can I find out whether I was affected? And what can I do about it? So that's the primary thing. Their response, I thought, was very good. The second thing we learned from this, and we learned this because Gen2 was decent enough to fess up in the breach notification and their summary of what happened afterwards. They did the great thing of helping other people to learn from their mistakes so they won't make it again and you don't have to either. It turns out, or it seems, that the developer whose account got taken over, although they were technically using a different password on every site that they had an account on, they were kind of cheating. And I know a lot of people do this because it feels convenient. You go complicated password dash FB for Facebook, complicated password dash TW for Twitter. And you think the crooks will never notice. They'll just think the TW is, you know, something like the hexadecimal string I put before it. Even if you have a fancy code that isn't obvious for Facebook and Twitter, if one of your passwords gets breached, and the, or maybe two of them get breached, unimportant passwords from other accounts, the crooks will quickly realize if you're using a pattern where only a little bit of the password changes each time. It's a little bit like having password 01, password 02, and password 03. The only way you can make a password complicated enough to be decent is to make each one truly unique. The simple rule is, if you can't manage it yourself, get a password manager. That way you don't need to worry about a, a core password with some tiny modification. So that was for poor practice. The second thing that Gen2 didn't do is they didn't, they didn't say to all their developers, all the people in the community, okay, if you want access to our repository, you have to use two-factor authentication. They kind of left it to each developer to decide whether they wanted the convenience or not, and they've changed their mind now. They're gonna to say to everybody, use two-factor authentication, that's where you get the one-time login code, because it raises the bar for the crooks, it would probably have stopped this attack it dead in its tracks. Um, we've had another another waving hand from Stephen. Excellent. And um, we've got a question from Teresa. She said, so that's what's happened. A developer's account was compromised? It seems so. The problem is that if you have one repository or one account, like say you have a corporate Twitter feed and you have 10 people who can that are authorised to post to it, maybe you know one in the UK, one in the US, one in, in Singapore or something like that, and a few other people dotted around, then only one of them needs to have a bad password choice, or only one of them needs to go, you know what, I'm not going to bother with two-factor authentication for the chain to become as weak as the weakest link. And so that's exactly what happened. It seemed that, to put not too fine a point upon it, we don't know the developer's name, so if, if you're that developer and you're listening, don't feel too bad about this. It's kind of like one rotten apple spoiled the barrel. And that's what you need, you know, if you're going to set security standards for your community, for your development team, for access to your Twitter feed, for access to your passwords, for the ability to restore backups, make sure that everybody is using security standards that are at least as good as what you want. It's no good having nine people who are way ahead of the crowd and one person who's lagging behind, because that's the person that the crooks are going to target. That's the person that's going to let them in. And Jeff's saying good passwords are an absolute must, but two-factor is a pain if you don't have a phone, though. Well, to be honest, in this case, if you're going to be one of the trusted insiders for something like a source code repository for a Linux distribution, then maybe that simply has to be the rule. Get a phone. Carry a phone. The good news is these days is that you don't need a phone that's online. So... In the old days, when phones first came into play for 
I was reaching for my phone there, but it's actually the one that we're using to record the video. The way that it worked is that the site would typically send you the code via SMS. And that meant not only that you needed your phone handy, but that you also needed a mobile signal. Wi-Fi wouldn't do. There are now solutions that work with SMS or with Wi-Fi, or that work just with having what's called an authenticator app. By the way, the free Sophos mobile security for Android and iOS has one of those authenticator apps built in. And that generates a sequence of numbers. They change, say, every 30 seconds, and that's synchronized with the server. And although it's not a perfect solution, it does mean that the crooks then typically need your username, your password, and your phone, and your phone's lock code. So yes, two-factor authentication can be a pain if you don't have a phone, but carrying your phone all the time, A, it's normal for most people these days, and B, sometimes that's the price of getting security right. It's much better to have the pain of carrying your phone all the time and making sure it's charged than it is to get owned. Oh, by the way, I forgot about C. Most two-factor authentication systems for emergencies do let you have some backup codes. You can print them out or write them down and lock, the way, lock them away in a safe somewhere. So if your phone does get lost or destroyed or goes completely haywire, you can still get back in and reinitialize everything. Um, Alex is asking, can Gen2 support most two-factor um, two factor options? I run Slackware and my main issue setting up my hardware, basically modified YubiKey encryption, was there was very little native support which resulted in hours of having to make it work. Oh, I mentioned Slackware at the beginning, and I knew someone was going, oh, you don't have PAM in Slackware, that's why it's no good. The, the whole issue of pluggable authentication modules, PAM in Slackware, is a huge issue in the Slackware community. Let's not go there. Of course, the issue here is that 2FA in Gen2 itself wouldn't have helped. This was two-factor authentication for the hosting site for their repository. The repository was hosted by GitHub. GitHub does support two-factor authentication. Many of the Gen2 developers were using it. It's just unfortunately that the number of people who weren't using two-factor authentication was non-zero. As for what 2FA should you use with your own Linux distro, well, to be honest, although I'm a lover of a big fan of Slackware, if you do need 2FA and you find it too much of a pain to use with Slackware, to get working with Slackware, and you find another distro that makes it easier, then don't feel married to the distro. That's the whole idea in Linux of having all these choices. It means there's something for everybody. So I'd love to say, oh, you should stick with Slackware and, and, and work away to get it all done and you know, knit things for yourself if you need to. Don't feel scared of moving away, whether it's to Gen2 or any other system. Okay, so Doug, so before we have... I nearly said open BSD, <laughs> um, but that's a topic for another time. Um, we were, you were talking about what lessons we can learn um, from, from the attack. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you go through all the lessons that you... Yeah, three. Basically, if you don't have a breach in the first place, is zero. But number one, if you do have a breach, be honest, be early, be plain speaking, be clear. Don't spend time trying to polish a bad thing to make it look better. Tell it like it is. Secondly, pick a proper password. It would have helped in this case. And don't try and cheat the one website, one password by having a core password that you just change a few characters in. Believe me, the crooks can figure that out. And thirdly, two-factor authentication is your friend. It doesn't prevent all break-ins, but it does make things a lot harder from, for the crooks. They pretty much have to guess your password or log your password and steal your phone at the same time. That does make it more difficult for them. So I think we can sum that, summarize that as kind of tread carefully and tell the truth. That's a very good way to put it. <laughs> I might have stolen that one from you, Duck. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all your info, Duck. And thank you everyone for getting involved and, and chatting and asking us questions. Um, keep your questions and comments coming. Drop them in the box below. And until next time, as always, stay secure. You didn't mention the football. Excellent. <laughs> Thought we'd got away with it. <laughs>